Um, it's then a question of uh, uh, the period from 44 to 45, and we have uh, here now uh, Rabbi Dr. Klein from the United States. Right, so if, if you just start, if you could just tell me, please, um, your first impression of Europe as you came across from England and what your work was then. When I came across from England with an LST boat, we landed in Utah Beachhead, and of course our first state was a living in tents. But the first community that I came to was Chart, the city of Chart, which was famous for its cathedral. And uh, I, my uh, first act was that I came to the mayor of the city, and I asked him if there were any Jews in the city of Chart. And he said there were seven or eight families, but all had been deported. I was not satisfied with that. I went to the Red Cross, and I asked the same question. And they gave me the same answer. They said there were seven or eight families, but they have all been deported, and nothing uh, was heard from them. But by mere chance, I found out that this was not completely correct. I was the official interpreter French interpreter for our uh, for my military group. I had uh, one semester of French in college, and on that basis, and, uh, I was elected. And this was more than 20 years ago. But it seems when uh, when you have to do it, you do it. And I was called into the military police that there was a gentleman there who was speaking uh, very agitatedly, and they couldn't get a word of what he said. And uh, when I, I was called in, and I tried to listen to him, and I didn't know a word either. But I tried very hard to catch on to one word, and with that I'll somehow make a beginning. And I got one word, uh, the word Aleman. Well, I said, Sprechen Sie Deutsch? So he said, Jawohl. Well, if you speak German, that I know much better than I know French. And I started speaking German to him, and I asked him what he wanted. So he said uh, that he was uh, trying to go back to Paris. Now, first I tried to get his background. He said he was hiding in this neighborhood, and actually he was not a Frenchman, he was from Poland. But that didn't give me a clue because there were more than two million Poles in that area in the mining section. Uh, then he said to me, uh, actually, I'm a Polish citizen, but I was born in the Litau. So I said to me, Zaita Litva was much So naturally, it's one of the scenes that is unforgettable. Yeah. We fell on each other's neck and started crying. And then we spoke in Yiddish. And the uh, military police uh, sergeant said to me, Chaplain, if you ever tell me that you don't speak French, well, I said, from now on, I'm speaking French very well. And we forgot the reason that he came for. I asked him, tell me, uh, what are you doing here? He said, I was hiding here all during the German occupation. So I asked him, uh, are there any other Jews here? He said, there are 12 Jewish families in this neighborhood. None of them know about each other. Somehow we know there are 12 families. They're all under false, as under assumed names. And, uh, but I can't tell you where one is, nor can they tell where I was, where I am. And so that's all I wanted to know. I took my helmet, and I went to the paint shop, and I had a uh, my chaplain's insignia painted with colors that look like neon lights. I always got the Yiddish paper from America to follow me. I went to the square of the city. I opened the Yiddish paper. Within a half an hour, I had all the 12 Jewish families around me. And one of the scenes was this, that a woman who wore a cross as a help to this guy ripped off the cross publicly, and she said, now I don't do, need this anymore. I can pl publicly announce that I'm Jewish. This cross is in the museum in New York. But this was the first meeting with Jews. I had the first high holidays in that section. It was on the Red Ball Highway, as we call it, the General Patton Road. The soldiers and the civilians and the civilians came together. It was one of these very touching scenes. But uh, these civilians that were there, naturally, immediately, I uh, took care of them, of their physical needs, as it were, uh, set them up back to their businesses. My second stop was in... Excuse me for interrupting you. 
Um, do you know by any chance, how did they manage to hide in these yes. places? Yes, I'll tell you how. First of all, they all had assumed names. Secondly, they stayed with families, and the families uh, adopted them as it were. I had a case of one man whose daughter, by the way, joined the French underground and was killed. I have a picture of her. This man played deaf and dumb for three years because he spoke French with a Polish accent. He came from Poland. And for three years, he didn't speak. He, so he shouldn't be caught. But he had false papers. They helped him out. Uh, every family, now, when I came into this woman who ripped off the cross, I met her children. One son is in Israel now, by the way. Kukermont. Uh, and the children, uh, when I came there, I asked them what their name was, and they gave me the name. So the mother said, Le nom vraiment. Now you can give the real name. Don't have to be afraid anymore. They all had assumed names. And I know one case, which was in shock, for instance, a young man, I have his pictures too, he dressed as a girl. He looked very girlish anyway. So for three years, he was a maid to one of the families. I have the pictures of the of him in masculine and a feminine guy. And for years he was able to hide as a girl, as the French maid of this family. And I asked him, well, uh, did the soldiers, how did you manage to, with the soldiers? He said, the German soldiers left me alone, but when the American soldiers came, that's when I had trouble. Because he wanted to stay in feminine, feminine garb until his parents came home to show them what he did. But the, he couldn't do it that long. And by the way, the parents didn't come back, unfortunately. So they were under, they were being hidden by Frenchmen. As a matter of fact, we had with us a camera company, the commanding officer, which was the famous American actor, Van Heflin. There is a movie that was made of my discovering these people and also coming to these families and giving official thanks for helping to hide uh, the Jews. Now, my, my favorite story of how uh, Jews survived is deals with a family from Holland later on. All right. This is a bit yeah. jumping the gun. This was much later. This happened actually at the practical end of the war, I was stationed in Reims, and there was a young lady there who during the war was in the monastery. And she has heard that her parents survived. Her parents survived in hiding in a Dutch village. And she insisted on going home. She was a young girl, and uh, she came to me and told me that she's going to go to Holland. This was in, in Amur, Belgium. She said to me, I want to go home. I said, the water's still on. It's dangerous. And I looked at the map. He said, you know, there's still German soldiers in your area, although officially they have declared that they're laying down their arms. And what's more, during the war, even Allied soldiers are dangerous. But she insisted, and so I went to the office of the Provost Marshal. I got permission to take my Jeep and my driver and an interpreter to go to Holland. I took the girl home, it was a, between three and four hundred miles from there. We came to a little town called Fassen. This is the northern part of Holland. And we brought the girl home to the family that was hiding in the home of the principal of the school. A uh, Meinherr van, van Beek. This is a family, a wonderful family, husband and wife, who said that their home the second story was occupied by the Gestapo. And they said, what better place is there to hide Jews than where the Gestapo has its office? Nobody would dream of looking for Jews there. And a Madame Koster and her husband and her son were hiding in that place. The son, Theo Koster, is today in Tel Aviv. Uh, the daughter that I brought home is married today, called Brandeis, and they live in, in Amsterdam. But I was in that little town, and it was still the war condition. The people still half starved, and uh, it, it was an amazing thing. It was, they hadn't seen American soldiers. I had to explain to them 
uh, uh, we were part of the Allies, they didn't recognize our uniforms. From there I went to Amsterdam. It was very interesting. We came to the city. There was no water, no light. The streets were ripped up because they were paved with wooden blocks and they used it for fuel. And when I came in, my jeep had the Magin David with the word chaplain on it. And uh, I was mobbed. I said I was the first American soldier. At the beginning, I was worried because on the road, we had convoys uh, the, of the German army, whole regiments marching from Amsterdam to The Hague to lay down their arms. And my driver, who was my assistant, uh, I said to him, now, if these Germans shoot us, who can stop them? So I said, at least let's give our life dearly. I said, I'm not supposed to shoot, according to rule, but you have your carbine. You get ready in case of anything, let, uh, let them pay for it. Well, he said, Rabbi, uh, chaplain, I don't have my carbine with me. I think uh, I can rely much more on your praying than on my shooting. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't do to us, uh, they didn't do anything to us, although they... Uh, looked very carefully, they saw the Magin David, and there was no, no, no mistake. When it came to the city, I said, the people were on the last stage of starvation. It was terrible. Somebody told me, before I came, that the rabbi of Utrecht, Rabbiner Justus Tal, who later became, right after the war, became the chief rabbi of Holland, was in hiding. I can't recall how I did it, but in chaplaincy we learned to do a lot of detective work to help the men that we were concerned with. And I found this uh, Rabbiner Tal in the home a professor from Gelden. He was professor of Bible at the University of Amsterdam. And he was in hiding there when I came in. It was a sight that can, you can't describe, that you'll never forget. Uh, he was emaciated completely, except for the feet being swollen. And uh, for first thing, of course, I brought him food. I took him outside, and he made a shechianu. He said, I haven't seen sunshine for three years. Not gone out from this place for three years. And uh, this is the thrilling thing was, I asked him, what could I bring you? He said, my library has disappeared. I need some books. This man who was a brink of death, starving, the first thing he thought of was books. Of course, I got him the books. Later on, he found his library. It was in, hidden in the steeple of the cathedral. The bishop hid the library of the rabbi in the steeple of the cathedral. So this is my first coming. Of course, later on, I came back again and again. My, to go back my, uh, with a story from Chart, I came to, to uh, Reims. Reims, we were right in the back of the German soldiers. As a matter of fact, we had to drag out uh, German soldiers from our offices. Uh, my Germans was used for the machinery that they left, and of course we had to be careful with booby traps. There I came, there was two families when I came. Before the week was over, 75 came back. I reorganized the community, established everything, a loan fund, a Zionist organization, uh, the synagogue was cleaned out, and I was elected as rabbi. I came to Paris to bring the rabbis, and the rabbis were all, 15 rabbis had survived. So officially, I was the civilian rabbi, too. I organized a school for them. A man came to me, as a, one gentleman I remember well, an Israeli, Monsieur Brown. He had a clothing store in Rue de Velle. I still remember the, the street. And he said to me, Monsieur Le Chaplain, the store is mine, but... The Germans took it over and gave it to a collaborator. I said, you come with me. We walked in, and I asked the Frenchman, do you recognize the gentleman? He said, sure. Do you know it's his store? Yeah. So, of course, he, he stuttered and hesitated. And he said, yes. I said, all right, back up and move. That's all I had to say. I did the same thing with several people, with a doctor. And the first week or so, this was possible. Afterwards, after we were court cases, and that was difficult. But at the beginning, they thanked God that he got away without any trouble. A military uniform uh, did wonders. I walked in and just say, you go out, and that's what they did. And uh, this Jewish community, whenever I go there, there is, a, there is, and I have been back a number of times with my wife, there's a holiday for the Jewish community. The whole community comes out. Uh, 
reestablish them. And uh, then they, they later on they have a, a rabbi today, Rabban Watnin from from North Africa. We still keep in contact with him. And I did the same thing with Valenciennes and a few other communities where we reestablished them in uh, Saint Quentin. Uh, in the, remember the between Saint Quentin and uh, and Laon, Laon. That's between Saint Quentin and Reims. From there, I went to Namur. The Namur story is very interesting for two reasons. There was a priest there, the Vicar Andre, who saved the Jews who lived there. There were no Jews there before, and he actually kept an orphanage for Jewish children. Many of them are in Israel today. And I came there, and uh, the first thing we did, of course, uh, we tried the best we could to help them. And at that time, refugees started coming back from Germany. Well, at what time would that? Uh, this mean? would be this would be in 1945 already. 1945, after the Battle of the Bulge. Yes. After that, at the Battle of the Bulge, I was in Reims. And actually, the air attack was from Reims. And I remember it was the end of December, and the weather was very bad. And that's why the air attack started uh, two weeks after they were in already. And I, I recall a very touching incident, a number of incidents, but this is that the Jews of the community came to me and said, Chaplain, do we have to run again? And I said to them, while I am here, you don't have to run. So they said, when you have to run, you have military vehicles. What will we do? Well, I went to the commanding officer, and he said, we have enough vehicles that we have, and the Jews want to come along, we'll take them along. And every day, with my military uh, outfit, with the, especially the, the uh, what do you call it? The helmet. Helmet. <laughs> that had that, uh, remember the cask, they said, uh, uh, the, with that uh, painting of the, of the uh, insignia. Every day I walked through all the streets where Jews lived. They waited at the windows to see if I'm still here. And they felt reassured, and of course they didn't have to go. In connection with this, I arranged for a Hanukkah party for the soldiers and the civilians. Mm -hmm. And of course the paratroopers were all stationed around there. They were getting ready for the jump over the Rhine. Instead of that, they had to go to, to the, for the Battle of the Bulge to Bastogne, the famous story with the holding out at Bastogne. These were done by the boys from my neighborhood. We arranged for a Hanukkah party for them for Sunday night in a hall in the city. For some reason or other, I went to the proprietor and talked to him. It was good I talked to him. Was, somehow he tried to uh, refuse the use of the hall after I paid him for it. Well, I just laid down the room. And then I said, if it's more convenient for you to have it Saturday night and Sunday night, I'll change it to Saturday night. It was just an impulse of the moment. And I changed it to Saturday night. And I had all the boys there from the paratrooper division. I have pictures of the party. And uh, it was a very fine affair. The next morning at 5 o'clock, all those soldiers who were there were on trucks to go to a bus stop. Mm. If I had it for Sunday night, yeah, it would have been an amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, after the Battle of the Bulge, we came to Namur, and I told about Namur, but there we had to do with uh, DPs started coming from extermination camps. It was very interesting that one group of girls came. Nobody could speak to them. The founder spoke Hungarian. I speak Hungarian, too. I, in 1956, I was sent by the State Department to bring the first boatload of Hungarian refugees on that basis. So here, uh, the first time, I left Hungary in 1920, and that time was Czechoslovakia. But I remembered from school. I come from a place that people don't speak it, but the schools were Hungarian. So. This came in handy for the first time in, 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 uh, in 25 years. I established a home for these girls and took care of them until, uh, until I left, until then the JDC took over. I came to Brussels, and there I came in contact with a Madame Perromont. 
Her husband is a professor of philosophy at the University of Brussels. And she was in charge of all the children's work. Through that, I came to the orphanages. And I came to the orphanages and I found out that they had nothing, no clothing, no proper food, no medicaments. So I wrote a letter to Mrs. Klein. And then we had a what you call a one-man uh, relief organization. The rule was that no more than five pounds, not five kilos, five pounds, which is less than half of five kilos, could be sent through military mail. And so Mrs. Klein sent me uh, between 50 and 100 packages every day. And these packages came, and the, the post office said to me, uh, Chaplain, we have to maintain a post office for you, because 80% of the work in the post office and this was headquarters for the 8th Bomber Division, the large headquarters. 80% is, is yours. And what happened was that Mrs. Klein sent me uh, clothing for these children and uh, medical uh, necessities from the boy, and then money too, from my congregation in Springfield, Massachusetts. From the boys, I came to the boys once, and uh, I asked them for money. I had boys who the first of every month, when they got their paychecks, brought half of it to me. And I used that uh, money for very good purpose, naturally. I uh, came to the mess halls where the boys were eating. Uh, one day, uh, they were getting oranges. Now, that was rare, but it had to be brought from America. I didn't get it often, but towards the end of the war, it started coming more regularly. I picked up every orange and I said to the boys, uh, you can do without it. At first they resented it, but after a few times they brought them to me. I brought the oranges and cereal and the other foods into these orphanages and uh, the packages too, and uh, actually helped maintain some of the complete orphanages. Uh, the JDC couldn't bring these things. They they were short money too. So this supplemented tremendously, tremendously the uh, the needs, especially especially these orphanages. Uh, we established scholarships from the soldiers of the camps, scholarships for uh, some of the children in the orphanages. One is today an opera singer in, in Belgium where, who went through school through us. The JDC every now and then calls, sends me a note that they want to change the beneficiary because one of the children, now this is already 20 years, almost 20 years now, so uh, these children have all grown up. But immediately after the war, every time I got a letter, one of the children with the beneficiary discovered a relation in America or other places that will take care of them. But I met a number of these children. I was in Israel in 1950. I met a number of them in the kibbutzim from these orphanages. And uh, they recognized me. I didn't recognize them. They were a child of 14 is now uh, 19 or 20 is a grown up person. But they recognized me. And uh, there was a kibbutz nearby, near Namur, a, uh, from Bachat, Brit Chabutzim Datim. So I remember very vividly, and I came to that kibbutz. These were ten boys and five girls. So sometimes one of the boys used to go to Brussels, home to his parents for Shabbat, so there was no minyan. I used to send the soldiers to stay there for Shabbat. They should have a minyan at the kibbutz for Shabbat. But the interesting thing was this. First of all, I looked at them how they were clothed. Rags. And wooden shoes. And I said, wooden shoes are very comfortable if uh, if your grandfather wore them, but when you start, the feet were blistered, they weren't used to it, and this was true both of the boys and the girls. They were very shabbily dressed. Well, with the boys I had no problem. I went to one of my bases. The 8th Bomber Command had 15 bases. I had to travel to all these bases. So I used to pick a base and I came in as boys, I need 10 uniforms. It didn't take very long. I got 10 un officers' uniforms. That means everything from shoes except for the hats. <laughs> that, that would make it a complete uniform. But I brought 
the ten boys were immediately dressed, and I had a problem with the girls. I came back to my headquarters, and there was a USO troop. USO, that was the uh, entertainers, theatrical people. And uh, the group was, uh, the leader of the group was a Jewish boy, the name of Carden, whom I met in 1950 again in Germany. He was studying medicine. This time, he, uh, since then, he had a doctorate in, in, in music, a doctorate in education. Now he wants the doctorate in medicine, too. But he was the leader of the group, and he, he said to me, he came to me, he asked if I could help him adopt a child. Well, I said, that's quite impossible, but I have some other work for you. I said, I, I want you to take your girls and strip them all. He got scared when he used the word stripping. The connotation isn't good. I said, don't get scared. I want their clothing. I need the clothing for girls in that uh, kibbutz, Hachshara farm. And uh, they did it. So I brought to the girls to everything from uh, everything the girl needs. I met these uh, boys in Hachshara, a number of them here. One of them, unfortunately, was killed in 1948, Knoller. I still remember his name. And has uh, met his mother in the kibbutz Yavne in 1950. But uh, I helped these with everything they needed, with food, with clothing. And I say, with the orphanages in, uh, in, in Brussels, I helped them with necessities which they couldn't get as yet. And of course, the DPs that came, we, uh, they came, uh, say, of Hefke. There was, at that time, nobody was equipped to take care of them. So in Namur, I had one house taken over for the girls, and one house taken over the boys. And they stayed as, as uh, well, I stayed there till I say about uh, August, July or August 1945. And then, of course, pardon, August. And then the, the JDC took over. And these people, for a long time, I used to receive letters from them individually. Now, this is the sum of my work right after the war. Uh, Mrs. Klein reminds me about uh, Vicar Andre. Vicar Andre is still an Amour. He is a Catholic priest who saved the Jewish community. Actually, uh, he was responsible for the Jewish community there, or refugees from Brussels that survived. In his home, he had about 40 children. He took care of them, and I came to him and I said, uh, Monsieur Le Vicar, we will want to express the thanks of the Jewish community of America and everywhere, but now I think we are equipped to uh, take these children under Jewish auspices. I couldn't get them out. He fought every possible way. Of these children, three had been converted to Catholicism, uh, three were on the way, and three were contemplating. Well, the, uh, those who weren't converted yet, we took over immediately. The three were, that were already converted, uh, I couldn't do anything with. But I found out later. Found out. I found them later on. They were good members of the Jewish community of Brussels and of Antwerp. But while I was there, he gave me a lot of difficulty in that respect. That he said he can't give these children until their parents come. Well, I said, we are the parents. Their parents won't come back. Some didn't come back, by the way. I remember I established a school. And he insisted that these children uh, go to school, go to the Hebrew school together with the others. And uh, this comes back now for a special reason. The case of uh, Brother Daniel in Israel. And when the case came out, I lectured in my hometown in Buffalo. I said, I have some personal angle to this uh, case of Brother Daniel. This Vicar Andre issued a little journal, a bulletin for the for the orphanage there. Uh, they call the Home des Anges. I have it in my files, in which he has an article. He said to me that he wants these children to go to the Hebrew school. He wants them to celebrate all the Jewish holidays that have a national significance. They all wore the insignia star, the Jewish flag. He said, I want them to go to Israel, to Kibbutzim. They'll be Jews of the Catholic faith. So this uh, brother Daniel is not new. I pleaded with him. He said, I know it's a dangerous thing. I said, Monsieur Levicaire, don't you think that at this stage of the game we have enough tzoros? 
without adding this new confusion. So he smiled. He smiled. But he wrote at that time, he said, if a Frenchman can be a Catholic or a Protestant or a Jew, why can't a person be a Jew by nationality and Catholic by religion? And he wrote about it in his bulletin, and he trained the children. So I remember I said to Monsieur Le Vicar, I want to warn you. When I start Hebrew with these children, I start with Shema Yisrael. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. One and not three. I said, at the very first day, we're going to teach him a lesson against the fundamental thing of your belief against the Trinity. Well, he didn't send them. Another thing, the synagogue that he had was a room. And in the room there are two pictures, one of Dr. Herzl and one of Vicar Andre. And he somehow had a stranglehold on that synagogue, too. He used to come to their meetings. So I found out why. Uh, they were organized at a, as a Hilsverein. Hilsverein, they couldn't mix in. So I came in and I, it was a struggle because on the one hand he did save them. On the other hand, he made any religious organization difficult. So I got the people together and I said, gentlemen, it's time if you want to organize a school to organize yourself into a Kultusgemeinde. And we did. They didn't understand what I meant, but the priest understood very well. And he put every obstacle in my way. But I succeeded. And we left friends when I left. I visited them again. But here is a case where, say, it sheds light on the case of uh, Brother Daniel, that it's not an individual case. That there is a, some idea of the church as a means of uh, a new angle in the process of conversion for which they still have hope. So uh, this was in, 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 in Belgium, in, in Namur. In, uh, in uh, Brussels, of course, I used to come every day. There I had to do with the orphanages. With every one, there was one orphanage in a, in a little village that was organized by the Germans as a model to show. Uh, and the interesting part was that the children all survived because the Germans did it, but the, in the end came, they wanted to do what they did in Germany. Well, the neighbors took these children. The children were all taken and put into hiding. When the Germans left, it was a short time. They somehow got wind of what's going to happen. And they were all saved. In this process, there was a young lady, a Belgian young lady, who later came to America. She lives in America today. Uh, last December, there was a program in, on television in the United States by... Uh, one of the famous reporters, Brinkley. He has a, a program of his own, and on this program, they had a special program on Christmas Day. It was a program featuring Gentiles who helped Jews survive during mm. the Hitler regime. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't see the program, but when I read about it, I found that one of the people was this young lady that I want to speak about. Her name was Jeanne Daman. She was a Belgian, French, and she was a teacher by profession. She worked with Madame Perlman during the occupation. Uh, she used to hide the children or teach them, and when the police came, she said, these are all non-Jewish children. And she did it at a risk of her life. And uh, she... Uh, work miracles and she was known by the community and she came later to America and worked for the United Jewish Appeal of America. She said to me she wanted to marry, a, she was a Jewish boy wanted to marry her, she refused. So I said I suppose because he's Jewish. Oh no, 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 he's not Zionist enough. I want to tell you a very interesting episode. On VE Day I was in Brussels and of course the streets were solid, a human wall. And I was on the jeep with my driver and this Jean Daman. And of course, every streetcar, every car was piled with people. They climbed over everything. We managed for a while to uh, keep everybody off the jeep. Well, it was slow moving with a solid uh, mass of people. All of a sudden, there were 35 youngsters on my jeep. It looked like a pyramid. Well, I thought they were attracted by the Mogain David on the jeep. 
it was a sugar tire group, and they recognized Jean de Marc. <laughs> Jean, 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 this one on, on VE Day. She worked with all groups, and I say now she came to America, I helped her come to America, and she, she worked uh, for the United People. Now she's married to a doctor and lives in, on the West Coast, I think, in, in San Francisco. But uh, the type there that we found that uh, at the risk of their lives, it was not, it saved Jews, it was not completely black. And too many, but those few that were, uh, we, uh, we should remember. Well, that was very interesting. Now, um, did you have any contact at all with uh, ch American chaplains that were working at that time in Germany? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I knew of many chaplains who did, uh, who stayed on and who worked with the Bricha, Lippmann, Klausner, Lavazer. Uh, these are, uh, I know them very well, sure, certainly did. See, we had a contact with chaplains who were in Germany later on because when I left, Mrs. Klein continued to send these packages. So I left the names of other chaplains who uh, f uh, first were in Belgium and in Holland and then uh, went into Germany. So she continued to send packages for a long time. And, but the, the work with the Bricha, my closest contact was first of all with the chaplain Lavazer who was first stationed with me. Secondly, I was uh, a boy from my home community who was my assistant, the chaplain's assistant is a gentleman who was a secretary, his driver. He was a boy from my community who was later transferred and he became the assistant of Chaplain Lippmann who did a great deal. Oh, what's his name, by the way? Eugene Lippmann. Yes, no, no I mean the, uh, the assistant. Simon Papa. Simon, he lives in Hartford, Connecticut. He's now a social worker. But he worked with, uh, uh, with Chaplain uh, Lippmann. Lippmann. And the chaplain called him, his name was Shimon, and he was called him Shimon Atzarik. So, and Chaplain Lavaza, who is still in the army and is coming out of the army, is going to settle in Israel. His family is here. He did marvels too. And then there is one gentleman, an individual whom I want to mention, who is a very interesting case. His name is Zisha Tchaikovsky. Zisha Tchaikovsky is a works for the Ivo. Yes, I know him very well. Oh, you do? Well, let yes. me tell you about but him. But I'd like very much to know about him because he never talks about it. Well, he does. <laughs> now, let me tell you about Zisha Tchaikovsky first of all. When I was in Reims, the paratrooper divisions, four of them that existed at that time, the 13th, the 17th, the 82nd, and 101st, were all around Reims. I was amazed at the number of Jewish boys and type of Jewish boys that were in these uh, paratrooper divisions. First of all, you had to volunteer. Secondly, many of the boys I found out kept false addresses because the parents at home shouldn't know. Then I found out what type of boys uh, volunteered. I had a number of boys who came from Germany. So they said they want to get back to Germany before the others. And then I had a number of yeshiva bachur. That was amazing. This Tchaikovsky was also in the 82nd Paratrooper Division. What did, he, what did he do in the Paratrooper Division? He was in charge of the archives of the Ivo, Yiddishir Wissenschaftlich Institute. And he kept ahead of the Germans, of the Nazis, a step ahead in France, and he found out he couldn't move fast enough. He buried them in France, went to Portugal, through Lisbon, he came with well, some of the last boats that came to America. In America, he volunteered into the army, volunteered to the paratrooper division, so that he should be able to retrieve the archive because I asked myself, a man of letters, a man of uh, the in the field of the, uh, that field, what do you do as a paratrooper? So he said he wanted to retrieve the archives that he left behind. And he did. He did. Not only did he retrieve the archives, but he was with military government later on in Berlin. And some of the things that he did are most amazing. But one of the things he did, he got the library of Streicher. The collection of Streicher is today in the Ivo library because of Tchaikovsky. I still see it when I come to New York. I see him very often. 
I'll give you my best regards. What is the name? <laughs> uh, Dr. Bauer, certainly. Yes, oh, he knows me very well. Certainly. Yeah. Tchaikovsky, we still keep contact with. <laughs> uh, my assistant, I have an assistant who is a dress manufacturer in New York. His name was Irvin Lager. And of course, you know, very often, as you very well know in everything, the type of assistant that you have means a great deal. So he was, in that period, he was with me in France, in Holland, in Belgium, and in Germany. And he helped me in many ways. I remember when I was preparing for a Seder for the soldiers. This is one of the very interesting detector works that I mentioned before, of getting in a small town in France a hall for 1,500 for 1500 to 2,000 soldiers. This is number one. Then secondly, to get the material. And the material, I wanted it, even the army, I wanted it should be kosher la Pesach. Well, uh, the question of getting uh, meat and the other things, when the soldiers found out that I wanted to do that, I had to get a shochit from Paris, uh, a lot of uh, little things. So the soldiers were saying, chaplain, we get meat every day. There's no uh, big deal in having meat. Give us something to remind us of home. I said, for instance, you filled the fish and borscht. I said, okay, fine. Well, I went to get a place, first of all, to for the soldiers. So the only place that they had was a big hall uh, uh, that was used as a store, at one of these big department stores. Um, Prisunek, I still remember the Prisunek. It looked like a beehive with tiers and halls, a big hall and, and galleries. So I requisitioned that for uh, for the uh, for the theater, and but it was empty. We needed to put in furniture. We needed to put in a water system. We needed stoves. So I got at my disposal German PWs, prisoners of war. We started working with them, and uh, when I was finished before Pesach, fine, I come in again, and <laughs> the, the place is occupied, the 106th uh, re division, that was, the, that the first impact of the Battle of the Bulge was then moved in for Estre. So they took over, and, and I was without quarters again, so I came to what we call the, the town major, that was the military governor of the city. So what am I going to do? Well, I looked again, I found a restaurant that had three floors, and on each floor, four floors, each floor could seat 400 people. So I came to the cook, to the owner, who was the chef too, he said, I want the place. Oh, he said, I'll give it to you uh, at night, 8 o'clock. He said, I want it for three days. For three days? Can't give it to you for three days, I have these customers. I said, now wait a moment. He said, these are soldiers. Now I had the 106th Regiment, I have 300 more Jewish soldiers to take care of. I said, you know, they just come back from the front. They have a fed religieux. Are you going to stop them? He said, what am I going to do with my customers? I said, well, leave it to me. I stood at the door at noon, and every time a man came in, I asked, will you object to eat some other place, to eat some other place for the, for the next few days so that American soldiers who come from the front should be able to celebrate? Me no, me no. Good. <laughs> so then I said to him, look here, if you do it willingly, it's okay. If not, I'll just throw you out, you know, before the front of the uniform did a lot of good. Then I said to him, not only do I want a place, I want to bring in my personnel and I'll pay you. So he felt insulted. Why do you want your personnel? I said, I want to cook Jewish foods. He said, there is nothing that a French chef can't cook. I said, you know how to make a filter fish? So what's if I said, filter fish is the way Jews make fish. He said, we oui, fish all I eat. <laughs> so I said, you tell me what fish shall I eat? So I found Alsatian Jews have a, what do you call a breaded fish, they call it. He said, I said, Monsieur, fish shall I eat? Ce n'est pas que filter fish. Que filter fish, ce n'est pas fish shall I eat. I said, you better let me bring my own cooks. When I brought my own cooks, two Jewish women, I brought stoves in from the hospital, field stoves, and uh, we put in, we wired the place with loudspeakers so that the and one place will make the say, don't even on the four floors, four floors. Now the question is where we get fish in the heart of France. So they told me that uh, further north there are fisheries, inland fisheries. So we took a jeep, and one of the women from Saint Quentin, who I saw again, is a young girl, today she's a, a mother of nice children, and we went up north to get fish. Now, 
dealing with French farmers is something like dealing with Arabs. Bargaining, come again. Well, it's all right if you have time, but here is two weeks before Pesach, and I needed 1,000 kilo fish. Well, he says, come again, come again, and we start that. So my assistant says, Chaplain, you do the religious work. When it comes to business, let me handle it. Just tell me how they say fish in French. He said, what's so? so he takes out a, a package of cigarettes and a piece of soap. With these things, you could buy all of Europe at that time. He said, Monsieur, poisson? He said, oui, oui, oui. <laughs> and we had on the spot a thousand kilo of fish. And, of course, we made the Seder. Uh, this is, uh, every Seder was a story in itself. And the boys have 1,500 to 2,000 soldiers. But the amazing thing there was there. This. No soldier knew where, let's say, another soldier who knew from home might be. I had a case, a nephew of mine was uh, in Europe, and he wrote to me, and each time he writes, why don't answer his letter? And each time I got his letter, I knew where he was, because I had access to the map and then the post office, yet uh, APOs would call it, uh, post office numbers, the army post office. So every time I got his letter, I ran. It was within an hour ride with my jeep. It took longer for a letter to come from an hour away than from America. Every time I come, uh, I came, he was gone. And unfortunately, then later the letter started coming back. He was killed in action. So, but the ordinary soldier might have a brother a half an hour away, an hour away. I didn't know. And one of the thrilling things was that every few minutes I heard a yell. See, I announced to the chaplains in the area that a sailor will be in San Cantan. So from a hundred kilometers surroundings, they all came. And it, it was every few minutes it was a yell. Either a brother, or they come from a hometown with two, three Jewish families, meet the Jewish boy from that community. It was the most amazing and thrilling thing. But, uh, you say, to make a Satan, with, with, as I say, borscht and gefilte fish, and the boys were most thankful, of course. And the other thing was, the army gave us rations. Uh, and... We got more than necessary. I supplied the Jewish community with rations which they couldn't get for the next six months. For it was a sort, we say, it was a pay for their help. The Jewish community mm. did the work for preparing. The hard work was done by prisoners of war. But I still remember this, uh, this say that when I come back, they, they still remember it. Uh, interesting was that the second say that was further north in Valenciennes, the Jewish community there. And then I had to rely on a Christian chaplain. I made a shidduch between the chaplain and the leader of the Jewish community, a gentleman by the name, a very strange Jewish name. He didn't sound Eastern European, but he said he came from, from uh, Lithuania. Bachartzina. Never heard the name before or after. Once after I heard it. He was the leader of the community, fine gentleman. So I got them together. I said, Mr. Bachartzina, you tell this guy, uh, Chaplain Hunt, a Presbyterian, what you need, and he'll get it for you. When I came there for the Seder, uh, there was war between the two. It's interesting how local customs misunderstood can lead to feuds. What was the, uh, what was the feud? The chaplain came to me and he said to me, Rabbi, I... I don't think you'll accuse me of anti-Semitism. You see what I'm doing for the Jewish boys in my outfit. But your Jews here have been giving me a lot of trouble. For instance, he says, I got potato rations. So I have double rations, not single rations, for 400 men. This is the number that we can accommodate here. We'll have. Mr. Bachatzina came to me and said, uh, are you trying to starve us? That's what you give us, uh, this the amount of potatoes for us? That's not enough. He said, I gave him double. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to steal half of it. I come to Mr. Bachartzina. I said, Monsieur Le Chaplain, you put in charge this guy over us. He's trying to starve us. He, he's not giving us enough. So both complained. I found out one thing. For instance, we in America, potato is a side dish. You put the meat and vegetables, you put small, a half a potato. This is the, in France, potatoes are a separate dish. You put a whole plate heaped with potatoes. That's a dish. 
So the Jew thought that the, the that the chaplain is trying to cheat them, and the the chaplain. So I explained to them the Sholom al Israel. But again, the the seder was something thrilling. The children, the civilians, I gave brought the civilians to the fore. Uh, they sang Hebrew songs, and Mr. Bachatzina said to me, chaplain. Three months ago, these children didn't know they were Jews. Mm. So, uh, wherever I came, of course, I brought the civilians uh, to the fore in combination with the army. I introduced the American soldier to a Jewish family, so I knew that the, that, that, that family was adopted. They will have nothing to worry with, with me. In, of course, the first high holiday services in, 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 in uh, Shark, I mention this particularly. We are human beings and we are very emotional. A, a service on what we call the Red Ball Highway for soldiers who tomorrow will be on the front. And you come into a synagogue, I don't have to tell you, uh, you people here don't have to be told at present, but you come into the synagogue where the guns are stacked in the aisle. And you deal with civilians who for the first time were there to admit they were Jews. And I have to speak to these people. Now, if you say, what can you say? I mean, uh, everything falls flat and becomes pale. So I was worried. I said, perhaps don't speak at all. It would be better to be quiet. But I read a, a, a mashal, a very fine story that I, I, I thought was apropos. And I, I want to tell that. They tell a story about a, a great painting that was supposed to give the story of Faust. So the story is given as Faust playing chess with the devil. And it's the last move. And uh, the last move means that the devil is winning. The devil says, Satan says to Faust, checkmate. It shows the two faces. That's the study. Faust, the man who is resigned to the worst. And the devil that shows with a leering eye of fingers clutching, ready to get his prey, the reward, the game. So this is supposed to exemplify the struggle between Faust, the story of Faust. So people came, and of course, when they looked at the picture, looked at the faces. The faces were studies and expression. One day, a man came who was not only uh, just a visitor, he was a chess player too. So he looked not only at the faces, but a chess game too. And then he gave a shout. He said, wait a minute. Faust didn't lose yet. He has one more move. When he makes that move, he wins. So I said, ladies and gentlemen, we won a game like just like this. But we have the last move. Yeah. When I said that, I mean, it hit home. There was silence for a while. I too was moved. I just couldn't go out. This was uh, the first people that I met. Yes, now, uh, um, when you came back then, in uh, 1949, when you were stationed with the military government. Yes. Well, in my work, as I said before, the church in Germany, the rumors were that they were sheltering many ex-Nazis. And when they wanted to bring them to court, the church said, he's a good Christian, a member of the church, how could he have been a Nazi? And when they wanted to interfere, they said, you in America believe in separation of church and state. You can't interfere with our religious uh, organizations. So the government felt that there should be a liaison between the churches in America and the churches in Germany. So they sent a Catholic bishop, Protestant representative, and a rabbi. And I was the rabbi. Because in, in America, whenever it comes to these things, they send a religious thing, they send three representatives. Now, here, naturally, I, uh, in that field, I had nothing to do. But as soon as the Jews found out that there was somebody with position, they, got, they found work for them. So I found out, for instance, that uh, many of the people were waiting for passage. For passage. 